So 121 looks at how we deal with these changes because as I said right at the start, if exchange rates didn't change, all you have to do is have something in a spreadsheet somewhere multiplying by whatever the differential was and that would be it and that would be pretty straightforward. So the fact that exchange rates move is what causes this problem. Um, of course, it'd be all a lot easier if we all just use one currency, but we've seen problems with using one currency across different countries when we look at the euro. So I don't think necessarily, yes, it would solve an accounting problem. I don't think it really solves, a, I think it creates other problems. So that's not necessarily a way to go. Before we get into looking at how we deal with this stuff, it is useful just to set up what some of these different currency definitions are. So the first one is a functional currency. And the functional currency is the currency of the primary economic environment in which that company operates. Now, that is not always cut and dried. If you're Woolworths, for example, you know, Woolworths are primarily an Australian company. They do have some stores and a division over in New Zealand. So you, you'd probably say New Zealand, sorry, not New Zealand's, New Zealand's functional currency should end up being the Australian dollar, but <laughs> Kiwi's probably, Kiwi's probably wouldn't say that. Actually, at one point, they were, they were, li they were seriously discussing making Australia, New Zealand, a domestic flight, like re changing it from being an international kind of, you have to sort of get passports out and all the rest of it to just being like a Eurozone type situation. You don't think that's a good idea? I haven't been, really, I haven't actually been to New Zealand in a long time. So it wasn't like that the last time I went. Can you do Australian passports at that end? Like, cool, that's pretty handy. Oh, well, you learn something new. I'm going to New Zealand in June, so I'm sorry, in July, so that's good to know. Um, you learn something new. But I mean, you look at New Zealand, well, actually a lot of New Zealand content, so you're a Kiwi passport holder? No. No? I just thought I heard a twang there, but that's all right. Apologies. Um, it's interesting because in, say for example, ABC, AB, the ABC have requirements to show a certain amount of Australian content. So they've got to show, I don't know what the percentage is, they've got to show a certain amount of Australian programming. New Zealand programming counts as Australian programming. Um, so as, as long as they're showing that sort of thing combined. I mean, you know, I think there would be, you know. But that said, New Zealand dollars appreciated against the Australian dollar recently. But for Qantas, for example, the functional currency starts to become more difficult because, yeah, they're primarily based here their headquarters are here, plane maintenance I think is still here. They have quite a, quite a strong domestic, um, domestic circuit here, a lot of travelers. The Sydney to Melbourne route is one of the most, one of the busiest routes in the world. I think it's like the third busiest route in the world, um, which is quite amazing when you think about the size of the country that we have. Um, they do obviously have a lot of international travelers who will be, travelers who will be paying in foreign currencies. So there you're starting to get a little bit more of a tricky situation, but I think Qantas is still a functional currency of Australian dollars. BHP, Rio, the miners, these guys dig a lot of stuff up here, they dig a lot of stuff up in countries other than Australia. Commodities are generally traded in US dollars, so that starts to become a little trickier what their, foreign, what their functional currency is. Um, I don't think it's something that we're going to look at in terms of making decisions on, but it is something to be aware of that that's not always a cut and dry decision. Presentation, company, uh, presentation currency is what you'd expect it to be. It is the currency in which the financial statements are presented. For a lot, if not everything, that we're going to be looking at in that subject, we're going to assume that the functional currency and the presentation currency are the same. It just makes life easier for what we're doing. Um, the foreign currency is something other than the functional currency of the entity. So if you're an Australian company with an Australian presentation and functional currency, and you would you are trading with New Zealand, you're trading with Japan, the US, Switzerland, wherever it happens to be, those currencies are your foreign currencies. So there are two types of things. There are foreign currency transactions. Um, so Australian companies buying and selling stuff overseas and there are foreign currency translations which are, which are the translation of Australian companies' foreign subsidiaries into Aussie dollars. And so we'll have a look at both of those. Um, the first one being transactions. So this is when you're shipping stuff off to somewhere else, you're bringing stuff in from somewhere else, you're borrowing money, something where you're transacting from here to somewhere else. Now, when we came back from London, we had our stuff shipped and it took 
ridiculously long time. We shipped it in July and only came in after Christmas. I had no idea why. Like it did take longer than what we were expecting. And up until it actually came in and, and landed in Australia, I had pictures of a ship like this with containers like this. And there's, there's ones on the internet where you see them leaning and containers falling off the back. I could just see that happening to our stuff. And until it landed in the country, I was like, phew, it's turned up. Um, not that I had a lot of stuff in there, which is of use, but you, know, you still, you don't want your stuff falling off the back of a ship. Initial recognition. So this is regardless of the type of thing that you're dealing with. On initial recognition, a foreign currency transaction shall be recorded in the functional currency by applying to the foreign currency amount the spot exchange rate between the functional currency and the foreign currency at the date of the transaction. So whenever it is that you've actually transacted with whoever you're dealing with, so you've bought something, you've borrowed money, whatever it happens to be, you look at whatever the exchange rate was at that time. So whatever the exchange rate was, that is the rate that you use. And we are simplifying things here. We're not worried about the differences between what you can buy the currency for and what you sell the currency for. We're not worried about transaction costs. If, because you know when all you see on the on the newspapers or if you look it up online and you see the foreign currency, you know the Australian U.S. currency foreign exchange rate is X, and then when you go to actually change money, it's always about five percent lower than that. We're not worried about that for here because it just it, start, it just adds in some complexity we don't need. So we'll just give you the rate, and that's the rate that you use. Subsequent to initial recognition, so at the end of each reporting period, firstly we're going to look at monetary items. So if it's a if it's a foreign currency monetary item, you translate it using the closing rate. So that financial year end date, you've got to look at is it a monetary item? If it is, then you look at whatever the rate is at that point. And for a monetary item, what is it? And it's an item which is monetary. It's probably a bit too simple. It's a unit of currency held. So if you hold foreign currency, if you hold actual foreign currency, then that is obviously um, a monetary item. Or if it's an asset or liability to be received or paid in a fixed or determinable number of units of currency. So if you owe money, so if you've got a foreign currency loan, if you have foreign currency owing to you, accounts payable, accounts receivable, all those sort of things, those are monetary items. And the closing rate is simply whatever the exchange rate is at the date that the statements get done. So the financial report, not when they get created, but the financial year end date, you look at whatever the exchange rate is then and that is the rate that you use. And that seems really logical. It, seems, it makes a lot of sense. Now, if you have a change, because odds on the foreign currency is going to be different, or the foreign currency rate is going to be different. If you do have a difference, that difference gets pushed through into profit or loss. So if things have gone well for you, you get a profit. If things have not gone well for you, you get a loss. There is an exception there, but we are not worried about that exception in this subject because we're not looking at net investment in foreign operations. So turning now to the first demonstration question. So what we have here is a foreign currency transaction with a monetary item. And we have a company who, which has agreed to to buy something, whether it's inventory or profit plant equipment, um, I think we're calling it inventory, with a value of um, $100,000 US. So if they don't pay it straight away, they're going to owe, owe $100,000 US. They do so on, well, sorry, they agree to it on the 12th of June. Title passes on the 16th of June, and they finally pay it on the 15th of July. And even though it's not listed there, we're assuming a 30 June year end date. So that's the information that's, that's in front of us. We have a set of exchange rates. And the first thing to do, and, uh, and I know I've stressed this before, if I mean, we'd like you to take away a whole bunch of stuff from the subject, but if there's one thing I think is really critical when thinking about these sort of things is a timeline. And especially for foreign currency situations, when we, have a, when we look at them next week, when we lay over the top a hedge, 
it is useful to have a timeline to see what's happening in the underlying position and what is happening in the hedge position because it when something happens becomes really important because you could have the same situation in a way happening and the accounting is different depending on the timing so it is important to do something like this so the 12th the 16th the 30th and what's this one the 15th of July so we've got four dates there so this is the one where we've agreed to it this is when it's shipped this is a financial year end and this is the payment date now the first bit is we've got to put in when the transaction actually occurs now if we purchase something inventory depending on sort of the free on board and, and the actual sort of details of the ship of the shipment generally we'll see the shipment and title being and title passing is when control occurs so this would be when the transaction happens when that when that title passes because at that before that point they don't necessarily have control um, the air conditioners are shipped and title passes on the 16th of June um, Depending on how strongly on how strong that agreement is, you may be able to walk away from it. And where I think we're assuming in this case that you can. If you can't walk away from it, that may lead to something else occurring. But we're not worried about that here. But at least in terms of the inventory, there's nothing happening at this point. So we just don't do anything. At this point, the shipments occurred. So we, we show the inventory in the books. We debit inventory. And we credit accounts payable and we work it out as 100,000 times the 1.0444 because one Aussie, one US dollar is equivalent to 1.04 Australian. And we've had $100,000 US that we owe, so that's the equivalent of 104,440. So 104, 104,440. And if you want to be strictly, I mean, probably helps just to reiterate the point that this is a foreign currency amount. That's a foreign currency account payable. Nothing happens until we get to the financial year end. And at the financial year end, we still owe that account payable. We may or may not have that inventory anymore. We're not actually focusing on that. That's not a foreign currency inventory amount. That's just inventory that we now have. Uh, the account payable is recorded at the closing rate, which is a spot rate at the 30th of June, which is 1.0934. So one dollar, well, sorry, $100,000 times 1.0934 gives you 109,340. We've got 109,340, and so the liability, which did start at 104, is now at 109. We need to pick up that liability increasing. And so to do that, we pick up the account payable going up, and that difference is 4,900. So we show the account payable changing, which is the credit account payable. That change is picked up as per paragraph 28. That is picked up through profit or loss. So we made a loss on this trend. Well, there's a loss that's occurred because that has gone up in value. Then we move forward to when we pay it. And it's gone up again to the Aussie dollar has weakened yet again. So one, one US dollar is buying 1.1045 Australian. So that $100,000 US is now worth $110,450. 110450 that difference is $1,110 and it's gone against us again. So what we started out owing, I mean, we owed $100,000 US, but that was equivalent to 104,000 Australian. By the time we get around to paying it, we now have to, have to pony up $110,000. So we're actually worse off. Um, and you can see the changes and those changes have come through profit and loss over that time. And we can see the payment actually occurring. Now we wouldn't be giving them 110,000, sorry, 110,000 dollars Australian. We'd be converting that and giving them 100,000 dollars US. But that's just picking up that idea. The account payable is gone because we paid it, and we get rid of cash because we paid it. And 
happy days. So we agreed to the purchase. Now whether or not we can back out of it, we don't know. Let's just assume we possibly could. The shipment happens, we take title, we recognize it. Financial year end, we still have that payable. It changes in value, we pick that up and we pay it. Now, just to give you, I suppose an entree into next week, I'm gonna ask you guys a couple of questions. At this point in time, at the 30th of June, you haven't paid that payable yet. Are you, is the company exposed to foreign exchange risk? Yeah, it is. It has a foreign currency payable. It hasn't paid it yet. If exchange rates move between now and when it pays it, it may have to pay more, it may have to pay less, but it, it is gonna pay something different if those rates move. At this point in time, is it exposed to foreign currency risk? Yeah, you have that payable on your books and you can see how that risk is coming through in terms of the profit and loss statement here. At this point in time, is the company exposed to foreign currency risk? Yes. I suppose it depends on whether you believe, like on how certain that they believe that transaction is going to occur. Because you could argue they could back away from it, but if they're pretty certain that they're going to go through with this, from an operational point of view, they are exposed in a sense of, to foreign exchange risk because if they, they know they're going to buy this stuff because they need inventory to keep things rolling along, they know that when they ultimately end up paying it, there's going to be potentially changes there. So think about it this way. You know, I, you know, even though I probably won't be, I don't know, it's, it's for work, so I don't necessarily have to pay for a lot of it. Um, but if I'm going to New Zealand, there's a far, I may not necessarily go, but it is highly likely that I will go. There is a concern from my end of foreign exchange movements because if, thing, if the New Zealand dollar gets stronger against the Aussie dollar, there's gonna be an increase in amount that's gonna be paid from an Aussie point of view. So just because I haven't absolutely gone off and done it, there is a concern there. Now the thing is, and what companies can sometimes do, and this is what we'll be looking at next week, is if they take out some sort of position to mitigate that risk now, before you actually have a sort of, they may take out a risk mitigation position now because of an expected future transaction. So they may actually take out a position at this point in time. And the issue that we have with that is, in between this period, we can see a profit and loss effect. So if there's gonna be some sort of derivative, we're likely to see the effect come through profit and loss in the derivative position. If we take out a position at this point in time, we can see that there's a profit and loss effect here. So if they take out a derivative, some sort of derivative position for a hedge, it's okay to put the profit and loss through on the other side because it will net off against it. But if we take a derivative position here, if we take some sort of hedge to mitigate that foreign exchange risk, there is no profit and loss occurring here because there has been no actual transaction yet. But firms do take out positions to hedge future risks. And so that is something that we're gonna look at is, in this case, they'll take out the, he the hedge gain or loss will go through profit and loss. So this is next week's work. But just to kind of give you an entree into it, for the hedge, any profit and loss will come through. In this period, any profit and loss will come through. In this period, there is no profit and loss down here because there has been no transaction, but there may be movement in the hedge position. And we're not too sure what to do with that yet. <laughs> Bless you. So that's what one of the things we're gonna be looking at next week is because these will match up, these will match up, but there's nothing to match up down here, so we've got to figure out what to do with that. Now, if you're not too sure what the hell I'm talking about for the last minute or so, don't worry, we will go through it next week. But it's just to get you thinking about how, where these risks are and how, if we're taking out a position before we enter into, into a transaction, how we could deal with it. So I don't know, if you have a spare moment, which you may well not, what do you reckon gets done with that? So that's a monetary item. You know, have a guess, see what you think, and see if you're correct for next week. <laughs>